You guys can watch that on your own time. <laughs> I'll send a link. That's James. James is James is very funny, um, and that talk is full of a lot of good points. So today, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, a paper that James wrote. James Mickens, famous computer scientist, probably, definitely the Pareto optimal computer systems researcher. When you talk about smart and funny, like. There may be smarter researchers and there may be funnier people, but there is no systems researcher who is both smarter and funnier than James, right? Uh, that's, the, that's an all set. Um, I think you guys know this. People here maybe are done. How many people are done? Yeah, okay. Everyone else is just brave. <laughs> let's, let's kill some time in class. Uh, um, all right. <laughs> so <laughs> I like that. I'm taking a break, you know? I haven't slept for a while. Uh, you can do some sleeping now, that's cool. Um, so 17% is where we were this morning. You guys have a long way to go to get to 70, 80, 95. Uh, it usually just goes upwards, hopefully. Um, so yeah, please do the, the course evaluation. I'd appreciate that. Um, unless you're waiting to do it because you hate me right now and you think you might like me better in a few weeks, in which case it's fine to wait. Uh, just don't wait until after the exam. Um, all right, so we've talked about virtualization this week, and I thought this paper would be a fun thing to look at uh, to sort of bring us full circle because it's sort of interesting. I mean, we've been talking about operating systems and operating system concepts, um, and yet in the, year, in the decades since operating systems were designed and implemented and distributed, the world has changed quite a bit. Um, so I would say, you know, today, you know, millions of people create apps Right, that run in a sandboxed environment um, and manipulate a rich windowing uh, interface in order to communicate with users. But those aren't native apps. What are they? These apps don't run on top of the operating system. Where do they run? You guys probably use these apps on a regular basis. How do you launch them? Where do they run? They run in the browser. How many native apps do you guys actually use on a day-to-day -day basis? How many people would say like under five? Include the browser. For me, it's like browser, iTunes, which is a total piece of crap. I hate that app. I wish it ran in the browser. It could not run worse, right? It is the weirdest, most broken piece of software. Um, Trying to think of what else. Uh, my terminal, I guess that counts. If I'm at three. Uh, sometimes a PDF viewer, but that always makes me very sad uh, when I have to do that. I would much rather have stuff like Google Docs. It's amazing that Google Docs' annotation features are better than PDF viewers. I, I find that to be shocking, but it is also true. Um, so yeah, so I'm at like maybe four, maybe two different PDF viewers because one of them's always broken in some weird way that the other one isn't. Um, anyone like 10? Maybe an IDE? So maybe we're at six. Anything else? What? Slack, use an app for Slack? 
Yeah. Why? Doesn't it run in the browser? I just go to some website. Oh, that's oh, oh, okay. That's just for notifications. Okay, that doesn't really count, right? I mean, normally you go to the web page, you use Slack. It might have an app that like pops up notifications or something. But Skype, maybe. What else? I mean, this this number is dropping, right? What's that? LimeWire. Lime okay. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> Alert the FCC. <laughs> um, what's that? Well, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Oh, okay, gotcha. It's even dodgier. <laughs> it's dodgier software <laughs> than the dodgy version. Um, yeah, so like, this is interesting, right? And I don't, you know, this is one of those uh, te technology transformations that I don't think anybody would have predicted uh, 20, 30 years ago. That, you know, native apps are, are, now native apps are alive and well in one place, which is kind of interesting. Where is that? Gaming. Okay, yeah, that's true. Games, right? So games still, Typically native apps, but there's one platform where native apps are still ruling, yeah. The phone. I don't know why that is. It's very interesting. I'm, I'm very curious to see what will happen. My prediction is that those apps are going to go away. So I love to point out the fact that my wife uses the, she uses Facebook and Gmail on her phone, but she does not have those apps installed. She goes to the web page in Chrome, and she, that's how she accesses Facebook on her phone. The thing that's amazing is that works. Uh, and apparently it works well enough that it doesn't drive her crazy. Same thing with Gmail. Like the Gmail mobile interface is terrible. It makes me cringe. It's really ugly. Uh, but she, she does things with it. She sends messages, whatever. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, at some point, it'd be interesting to see what happens on, on mobile, but I suspect that things are going to go to the web, right? Meaning um, that, you know, the, the code that you guys are, and most of the code that you guys download and run today is in this language called JavaScript. Right? You know how many days it took them to develop the first version of JavaScript? So I shouldn't have said I shouldn't have said days. I gave you guys a clue. Do you know how long it took them to develop the first version of JavaScript? Ten. Sorry. Oh come on, you can't develop a whole language in a day. That's ridiculous. Right? Ten language, ten days, or ten or eleven or something like that. Right? So like Java, they spent two. Like Sun spent years developing Java. Okay. Java development started years before JavaScript development, and yet JavaScript was released before Java. Right? I find that to be shocking. And that is the modern computing experience. So again, talk about unintended consequences. right? When Netscape decided to put JavaScript into the browser, I don't know if anyone at that point realized that that was going to change the entire face of computing. But it did. And so that's where we are today. Um, if you want to run web, if you want to write web apps, you have to use this nasty language called JavaScript that somebody wrote in 11 days. Yeah. Oracle? Oracle? Java support? No. No, no, no. Yeah, no, Oracle doesn't, doesn't support JavaScript, right? JavaScript and Java have nothing to do with each other, first of all. Just understand that. They're totally, completely separate, distinct, unrelated languages. They just happen to have similar names. It's very confusing. I know it confused me for a long time. No, JavaScript's not going anywhere. I mean, I think at some day we will have a replacement for JavaScript, but it will take a long time to emerge. Right? But just the fact that we got to this place is, on some level, if you are sort of an ironic person, hilarious, right? Like, all, think, think about those people at Sun. It's like, we spent years developing Java. It was going to run everywhere. Write once, run everywhere. That was our mantra. And these, this guy, in 11 days, you know, like, beat us to the punch. And now JavaScript is what you write once and run everywhere, right? It is incredibly funny. Someone's going to write a book about this one day. Maybe it'll be me. Um, I, I just think it's a fascinating story, OK? So what this means, the combination of, of the web and, and the fact that you know, HTML, CSS is actually a pretty nice, uh, nice representation for, for most, uh, lots of different types of apps. You can see it in, in lots of different types of places and different contexts. Um, it means to some degree the web browser has become in many ways akin to a modern operating system. So the web browser is almost its own virtual machine that when you go to a web page, you download a piece of code and run it inside this virtual environment. Um, it is not, it is in, in no way similar to the virtual machines that we've been talking about in this class. It does not attempt to present any sort of hardware interface, 
But you know, this is sort of how things work today, right? I mean, it's, you call it an interpreter, call it whatever. But the structure of the browser means that it's taken on a lot of the responsibilities uh, traditionally associated with the operating system. So multiplexing resources, right? Why does the browser have to do this? Why does the browser have to multiplex resources? When the browser is multiplex resources, what is it multiplexing them between? Yeah, tabs or windows, right? I mean, in the OS, you talk about apps that are competing for resources. In the browser, you have different tabs running different websites that are also competing for resources, right? So this is sort of the equivalent there. Um, protecting applications from each other now becomes protecting unrelated sites content from each other. This is Super important. Why? Yeah. So that's nice. I'm that you have not allayed my fears. Yeah. Yeah. When you go to like sketchywebsite.net and then you open up your bank in the other tab. You hope that sketchywebsite.net isn't, isn't getting leaked information from that other tab where you are entering your bank password, okay? Um, this is actually surprisingly hard to get right. Um, and, you know, and, and also, when I start downloading various JavaScript resources and other things, there's rules about the types of content that they can have access to. Um, and this is pretty important. Uh, people also do incredibly dumb stuff in their web browser. Did, it, did anyone... Uh, did anyone fall for the whole Osama bin Laden death video thing that went around on Facebook a few years ago? Did anyone remember that? Did anyone see that? It was like click on this, like click on this link or cut and paste this huge link that's like 30, 30 lines long into your browser to see the hidden Osama bin Laden death video. Do you know what that was? That's a bunch of JavaScript that ran in your Facebook context and like spammed that message to all of your friends, basically, right? And yet, like millions of people cut and pasted that into their web browser. Hey, let's try this, right? Let's see if let's see what happens when I. I don't know. I've never seen a URL that long before. Normally, they're like ten characters, and this one is ten thousand. But who knows? Maybe it'll take me to that Osama bin Laden death video that I really want to watch, right? Um, I had a friend who used to work at Facebook, and this this sort of thing drove them nuts, right? Um, same thing here, right? So the browser provides an API, and that API, in a lot of ways, provides. Again, sort of abstract resources, right? Whether it's events, uh, the DOM, which you know is this ab abstract data structure that represents the content on the page that uh, JavaScript, you know, manipulates to in order to create the interactive web experience, right? Um, so what's the, so so this is interesting, right? I mean, to some degree, the browser seems to have all these features that are very similar to the operating system, and you know, now a lot. Rather than, rather than having like 10 different icons on your desktop that you click to open native apps that do various things, you have 10 different browser uh, bookmarks that you click to send mail and listen to music and collaborate with others on documents and whatever, right? Write code. I mean, that's clearly the next thing that's coming. Now, there's already some tools out there like that. I mean, anything that you are not doing in the browser right now is going to go in that direction. In a lot of cases, there are already ways to do it in the browser, and they're not, they may not be beautiful yet, but they're, but they're coming. Right, um, but what's the big difference here between, you know, historically, between the operating system and the browser that might create some problems? So the operating systems were like when people designed operating systems, they had all of these things in mind, right? There were these well-defined goals: we're going to protect applications from each other, we're going to, you know, um, you know, th this this was how operating systems were designed. This was part of the spec. They were already, already designed to do this, whereas web browsers started life as applications, and over time, as we've been migrating more and more computing functions into them, they've sort of had to take on this, these new responsibilities in this really ad hoc way. So, you know, for, for example, if you think about how web browsers work, the, the operating system does not allow an application to basically give it a huge chunk of code and say, I would like to run this in the kernel with kernel privilege, right? That would be a terrible idea. Um, whereas the browser, every time you go to a web page, has to take this huge mass of JavaScript and somehow run it, you know, which is a train complete language, and somehow run it safely um, inside that tab, right? Uh, so this is a much, much uh, different challenge. 
Um, and so <laughs> browsers are probably not uh, necessarily going to make very good operating systems, despite the fact that there's a huge amount of work in this area about how to make them better operating systems, including um, the work that we're going to look at today. All right. So, um, so, so I would encourage you to watch some of James' videos. They're, they're very funny. They're also educational. Um, so you can giggle along with him as he makes fun of JavaScript uh, and then uh, also be learning something along the way. But I'm, I'm not going to try to sort of steal his thunder here. Instead, what I thought I would do is uh, show you some of the video where he presented this paper. And I'll stop it at various points, and we can kind of explain what's going on. All right. Um, so here is James. I'll turn the sound up. So let me, <laughs> let me back up a minute here. Unfortunately, I'm sorry it's so blurry. I don't, you know, again, this was only a few years ago, but apparently the top conference in computer systems had not figured out how to videotape uh, talks with a high degree of resolution. So I don't know. I, maybe it's supposed to look retro, right? Like we're supposed to think, wow, this is a great talk from 1986. Uh, it's really amazing that they were able to videotape it at that time. Um, so what's the overall argument here, right? So what is the, it, when we talk about the API, Right? We're talking about the interface between you know, two pieces of software. What is the operating system API? You guys have been working with it this, this semester. I mean, what was the operating system API consistent? What's that? System calls. System calls right? That is the operating system API that it provides to applications. That is how you get the operating system to do things on your behalf, like allocate more heap, like open files, whatever. And that API defines, to, to some degree, you can think about the security or the vulnerability of the operating system being a function of that interface. If that interface is well designed, and if that interface is small, too, which is also kind of important, then the attack surface is fairly limited. So you can think about it this way. The, the kernel has to support all of these different functions that applications can call. And on Linux, maybe there's like a couple hundred or something like that. Every one of those has to be completely correct for the operating system to be secure and also for the operating system to be correct. Now, if I have a bug in some you know, rarely used system call, somebody will find it and someone will uh, produce a binary that exploits it and uses it to do something bad. Um, or it could crash the system or whatever. So the, the interface and all of the lines of, the co of code that are required to implement it are sort of measure to some degree the size of the problem that the operating system has to solve for it to be secure. All right? Um, now, to some degree, in order to uh, you know, improve security, operating systems have tried to keep this interface fairly limited because that makes it easier for them to, you know, uh, there's less, just fewer lines of code to fix and make sure are correct. The web browser on the other hand. What is the API that he's talking about when it, that it provides? What is the web browser API and who uses it? Give me some examples of things that must be part of the web browser API. Yeah. What kind of requests? 
Yeah, so the web browser gives me the ability to uh, initiate network traffic. That is how every web page, reactive web page that you have been to works. So when you go to Gmail, it opens up some sort of network connection back to Gmail servers that is active for the life of your session. That's how, that's how messages sort of just appear in your Gmail interface is there is code running that has a network connection open to Gmail servers and it got a message that said you have a new a piece of new mail. What else had to happen for that new message uh, notification to show up? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, rendering images and, and sort of adjusting the DOM, right? So essentially, the DOM is the data structure that determines how the page is laid out. And when a new message comes in, I clearly need to add a new entry to the visual layout that you are looking at in order to alert you that that, is, is, that has happened. I have a new message. It has some styling associated with it so I can tell it's new. I update a number over in the corner that counts the number of new messages, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, what else? Yeah, so, so to some degree, I mean, R Rob's answer is, is the, the interface is used by JavaScript that comes on the page, right? So the, you know, because again, I mean, to, to some degree, if there's no JavaScript, all that I'm doing is I'm just interpreting a static piece of HTML content that the web server sent me. And that's fine. That works, that works very well if you have static content and it doesn't need to do anything fancy. But the API that he's talking about that the browser provides is provided to JavaScript that runs. So when your JavaScript starts to run on the page, there is this list of functions that it can call that will cause the browser to do various things. Um, and that interface, first of all, was not really that well designed in the first place, certainly not designed to support these sort of rich web applications, and is enormous. It's got all sorts of functionality in it. And that makes it very difficult to get right, okay? Uh, so let me let him keep talking about the ways in which people get it wrong. There's a little secret about the web, okay? There's a secret that the aggregate web protocol is actually huge as that. So what do I mean by the aggregate web protocol? Well, browser has to support things like HTTP, for example, better content. And there's a lot of people who are like, well, I don't want to do that. Well, if you want to do that, you have to support JavaScript for client-side interactivity. That's both the core JavaScript spec that finds things like some regular striking, and also the DOM line, which allows JavaScript to interact with the rest of the browser. Now, don't forget, some people also use Atlas, don't know why. But <laughs> that's the web protocol as well. And while we're talking about all that, let's also throw in Silver Lens, let's throw in Glass, let's throw in WizCon. Don't forget the Canvas and Video Pack, which are these new suggestions for how to provide rich client side graphics. And long story short, how much time do you have? As it turns out, writing a web browser. So does, does this make sense? Like this, to some degree, what he's trying to describe is the aggregate functionality that web browsers are forced to support. So again, I've got to, clearly I have to support the HTTP protocol because that's how I actually get the web page in the first place. If I don't support that, I'm in trouble, right? That's also frequently how JavaScript that runs in the browser accesses resources other places while the tab is open to do things like fetch new messages and upload things and blah, 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 okay? Um, Obviously, HTML and CSS, that's how my pages are laid out. That describes how they're supposed to look. Um, the core, so when he talks about core JavaScript, he's talking about just the JavaScript, like the, the JavaScript language that you could run in like Node.js, right? JavaScript has built-in support for things like regular expressions and just being able to interpret JavaScript generally. And then the browser provides all these extra features to the JavaScript that runs on the page because by the way, that JavaScript also usually wants to manipulate the DOM, right? That's how you get the page to look different. When, the, when you look at a web page and it changes appearance, it's because some piece of JavaScript manipulated the DOM and caused it to look different. And that can be done in a gazillion different ways, okay? Um, you know, libraries like jQuery really started out as convenient ways to manipulate the document object model. Um, applets, <laughs> yeah. Who use, has anyone been to a web page that had an applet on it recently, like in the past couple weeks? Was it not, for, have, have you, okay, let me ask a question differently. Have you been to a website not for a course you're taking that had a Java applet on it? All right, see, I got two of the hands that go down. Why? We use really archaic software for Oh, okay, yeah. So he, he was forced to, right? Like when I go to a page with a Java app, it's like run away right away, right? That's like one of the first things that will cause me to just close a tab. Like I don't care what it is, right? I'm not gonna click eight different checkboxes 
and then wait 10 minutes while the thing fires up and updates all the Java things in order to show me whatever crappy Java applet that's going to look super ugly you want to run in the middle of the page. Right? Just not doing that. Um, usually those pages haven't been updated since like the mid-90s anyway, so it's a good, good, good cue to go away, right? Um, you've got all these other plugins too that on some level the browser has to be prepared to support. So when you embed a PDF into a page or when the browser opens a PDF, th think about it, like the browser has now become this like, the web browser has now become this like general purpose file browser. And have you guys, any of you guys ever actually ever used it this way? You can actually open local PDFs in your web browser and a lot of times they look better than they do if you open them in Adobe Reader, right? And that's sad, but true, right? Um, so to some degree, like you can use your browser to open local files, and sometimes it actually works out better than if you did it some other way. Um, you got, you know, you have secure, the secure web protocol. For some reason, I have to be able to open local files like I just said. I don't know what that's for. Um, you have this idea of what are called web workers. So tabs are supposed to be able to, to provide bits of JavaScript that run periodically in the background to do various things. Um, and so this, this is hard. Right? This is a very, very big, complex interface that browsers are forced to support um, in order to sort of satisfy the needs of their users. And, and to some degree, I, I think I would argue, I think James would agree, that there's not, there wasn't a lot of thought that was put into this. It was kind of like, okay, like Microsoft came out with something called Silverlight and then everyone has to support it somehow, right? Despite, because the Olympics website used it once, right? Um, and, you know, that was annoying. Um, so, like, some of this is improving over time, right? Um, but slowly, right? I mean, I would argue that Canvas and video have made some of the GUI crap go away. I mean, the video tag's really nice. It replaces a lot of the old flash and things like that. Anyway, so we're improving things over time, but um, this is really, really complicated. Oop, sorry. Mark, you're all these different protocols. And don't get it through none of You're always asking, which version of these protocols does the browser All right, Does, has anyone ever experienced this? Has anyone built websites? And like, you know, you, you build it, hopefully you guys will all do this someday soon, right? Uh, because again, like this is, mod, this is modern computing. Um, so when you build a website, it's fun. You got this great looking page, put some work into it, looks awesome, it's running really well. Uh, and then you're like, I should check and see how it looks in Internet Explorer. And then it's just sadness, right? Because it doesn't look right. It's broken. Things don't work. Zach, you have a... What's that? I have an experience Yeah, so I had that experience the other day in here. I don't know if you guys noticed this, but like Firefox broke my slides, right? I don't know why, right? And I don't really care that much. Um, but <laughs> the website is only supported on Chrome. I'm going to put a logo on it, right? Um, but yeah, Matt. Yeah. I hate you. Yeah, go somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like this, this is just really sad. Okay, and and this is still true. Okay, so this was actually like way worse, probably ten years ago. Right? Does anyone ever remember, remember Quirks mode for IE? Right? 
<laughs> like what? That's like the most messed up thing when your application, like imagine if your OS had the equivalent of quirks mode, right? It's like, I'm going to put you in this weird mode where all the system calls work a little differently, right? Uh, because I'm trying to use that to work around some broken websites that people wrote for older versions of IE. So IE used to have a way, like what, wh how this worked was that IE used to have a way where you could put this declaration on the page that would essentially cause it to render things differently for no reason other than the fact that maybe it made your web page look a little bit better. So it was like, does my app work? No, try turning on quirks mode and run it again. Maybe it'll work that time. If it does, then just leave quirks mode on because clearly that's what you need. Um, so yeah, that was strange. Um, some of this, again, I would argue some of this is improving slowly, and he'll mention why in a few minutes. I mean, there are now things like WebKit, right? So for layout, a lot of the browsers are using basically the same rendering engine, i.e. still not so much. But uh, I, think, I think Chrome, Firefox, maybe Safari, you know, use a common library for, doing the, for, for performing the process of taking HTML and CSS and converting it into this pixel map that you see when you go to the page, right? Has anyone ever seen like layout differences that were caused by different browsers? Um, this is particularly, yeah, because I mean, this is hard. You know, give, give the people that wrote these browsers some credit. This is very difficult to get right. Um, and then if you want to do any sort of weird scripting or whatever, I mean, my favorite is I, I still go to these websites that are, that are broken on every other browser but Internet Explorer. And they, the best thing is they don't know that, right? So they just fail. You know, you're, you're clicking on something that looks like it should be able to be clicked on and it doesn't work, right? And then you're like, okay, let me fire up my Windows VM and see if this works on it. Of course it works on Internet Explorer, right? Um, so, so anyway, so this is, this, this is very, very frustrating. And it creates a lot of headaches for people that are trying to develop these interactive web pages. Even if you just want your web page to look the same on different browsers, it's still not that easy, much less behave in the same way. That's, that's even harder. So you're not going to write this talk. So first, I'm going to give you some case studies to show you how exactly browsers will fail you. All right, does this make sense? First of all, that's clearly made up, okay? Because if you've been to faculty web pages, you know that most of them, most of the faculty web pages do not use jQuery, right? <laughs> or haven't been updated since 1995, right? One of the two, right? Uh, or both. So, so I, I totally don't believe that. I think if you talk to 10 professors and see, even in computer science, nine of them be like, what is jQuery, right? Um, so, but, but what's, the, what's the premise here, right? How many people have used jQuery before, right? Okay, great. Um, so what is jQuery supposed to do? jQuery is supposed to help you with what? There's this problem that we've identified, which is different browsers work differently. Um, and jQuery comes to the rescue in what way? Yeah. Yeah, so jQuery is, in theory, jQuery is designed to paper over some of the differences between different web browsers. So I've never looked at the jQuery source code, but I'm assuming deep inside of it, they do some browser detection somewhere when you load jQuery on the page. And then, depending on what browser you're running, the J core jQuery features and functionality that you access work a little bit differently. So for example, if one browser's DOM traversal is a little bit different than the other browser's DOM traversal, jQuery will just do the right thing. And you can just write your jQuery expressions, and they will work the same way on different pages. So this is the dream. Right? This is what's supposed to happen. Um, oh, let's see what actually happens. That's what you think. Now, here's the way it actually These browsers are murder speeds. Okay? And so what they do is they present you a plain, semi consistent set of APIs. And so what this means is that jQuery, or applications like jQuery, yeah, they can really hide its interface. It is, in fact, nicer. The problem is that this interface is only 
partially browse the news. As it turns out, jQuery cannot actually hide all these cross browsing and And so I'm going to go into more detail about this. So take my hand, if you will, and join me on the garden path that I like to call Why the Suicide Rate for Web Developers is 89%. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get started. <laughs> Makes sense. Maybe if you guys haven't done web programming, this is sort of new to you, right? So, so it turns out this happens when you click on a web page, all of it. Uh, maybe you never knew this. Um, so the idea is, wherever you click on the page, there's there's these two things that happen. First of all, there's this one type of event that propagates downwards from the root of the page. So the the page is represented in the document object model as a tree. Every little item on that page is, has a path to the root, it's to some degree like a hierarchical file system, and you can name it. That's what XPath is for. Um, so in the, you know, in the first phase, and I'm sorry these are slides are so blurry. I should have grabbed the deck. Um, in the capture phase, the event propagates downward from the root to the node that generated the event. So I clicked on something. There has to be some element of the page it was targeted. And this gets really complicated because I can have elements that overlap and I can set heights for them, so whatever. But there is some element that I clicked on. Capture phase, I go down. The element itself um, has a chance to process the event in the target phase and then it propagates back upwards. And the idea is that in order to implement various types of interactive behavior, Various elements on this path can define handlers for these events. So give me an example of what one of those handlers might do. Like, what happens when you click on a web page? Nothing? What's that? that? That probably has some file system dialogue that's required, right? A more typical thing. You click on a web page in a particular spot, and what happens? Nothing. It's pretty boring. It could open a new page, right? Now, now that might be handled directly by the browser, but what's it like a JavaScript thing that happens? Yeah. What's that? No, that's what's going on behind the scenes. Why are you doing this? Yeah. Really? Yeah, it might open a drop-down menu. Okay, that's a reasonable answer. What else? Right? I suspect you guys do this fairly often to do a variety of different things. Like what? Alerts? Come on. Okay, you guys use the internet, right? <laughs> like, you click on web pages. <laughs> really? You see those alert boxes? Those are very ugly, by the way. Like, please don't use those on your web pages, right? That's another clue that it's time to go away. Um, alerts are firing. Uh, no, like, a menu opens, or email gets sent, or the, you know, the, the movie starts to play, or, you know, the music starts to play, or whatever, right? Or I locate, like, by the way, you know, Google Docs is just entirely a big blob of 
very, very, very complicated JavaScript. Like the cursor moves to a new location and it lets me start typing, right? I mean, this is how you interact with web pages. Every time you do this, this is happening. And, and the model is designed to support a lot of different types of behavior. So for example, the document has a chance to observe every click inside of it, if it wants to. There's cases where that's useful. You can probably imagine you know, various types of uh, web pages or web applications that you'd like to build where it would be nice if not only could I do something when a particular button is clicked, but the page actually gets notifications every time you click anywhere, right? That's during the bubble phase when it comes down from the top, right? All right. Uh, oh, this is bad. My events are not bubbling properly into this window. This is huge problem, So, makes sense? Again, I mean, you guys are aware of this. What, 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 like, what is the Blur event used for? You guys might have been to a website that was designed in the last five, 10 years. Uses this to do what, maybe? Uh, so, like, make login screens that pop up fix to grab your yeah, Well, I could do that. But remember, the Blur, the blur event's weird, OK? Because it's fired when I, I've entered something into a box and then I leave it. What might the page want to do at that point? That would be awesome. That would be like helpful. Let's say you're filling out, like you're buying something online and you're entering some information into a form. What can I, what can the form use the blur event to do? Yeah. Well, th that I'm gonna, that's gonna happen when I tab and there's a way to order the fields that, in which the fields show up. But what might I do when I leave? Auto complete or I could validate the input too. You've probably been on, I mean, how many people, it's very frustrating, right? Like we're, our expectations about web pages are changing. It used to be that you put in all of your information and then you hit submit and then the page would sit there spinning for a few minutes and then you would get an error message being like, you didn't fill out the state or something like that. And now what happens is, or you know, you misspelled your name or the credit card number's invalid. And now what happens a lot of the time is as you're entering the information, the, the form is actually doing validation in the page, right? So by the time you actually get to the submit button, we're pretty confident that you know that's a Visa card that you entered and it's a valid card number. It has the right number of characters at least. At least we know that, right? Uh, those can be done by the blur events. When I leave the box, that's when my input is complete and that's when the right time to do validation. All right, I don't know if we're gonna get much farther than just letting James outline the problem. But. So, Just skipping ahead here. All right, I'm just going to pause, James. I'll cut to the chase since I know we're almost out of time. You guys can watch this online at your own leisure and maybe actually be able to see it. Um, so, so essentially the, the solution that James proposes is pretty clever. He says, look, um, you know, there are all, so what happens right now is the page comes down and has to deal with all of these browser, uh, cross-browser incompatibilities and 
it's extremely hard for browsers to provide this huge interface to support all the things that a page might want to do. So what we do, let's design a new browser interface. So we first say this is an exo kernel browser. We haven't talked about kernel structure yet. Uh, we probably won't this semester. But um, the idea here is let's change the interface. So how do we make the browser interface a little bit more like the operating system interface that we're familiar with? Um, what, what would a, so if, if, you're, if you're thinking about a minimal browser interface, the most minimal browser interface possible, what are some of the things that it has to do? It is not the null set, clearly it has to do something, but what are some of the things that the minimal browser interface would have to do? What do I have to do to get null pages to work? Yeah, Steve. Nope, not true. Minimal. I do not have to parse HTML. What, what do I have to do? There are things I have to do. What's one of them? Yeah. OK, so I do have to let the page open network connections. That's important. That's, uh, that I can't get around. If I page can't do that, I can't communicate with the outside world. What else do I have to let the page do? Yeah. Um, so Render an interface. How am I going to render that interface? What's the simplest, most minimal way to render a browser interface that requires the smallest interface and lets the m sort of tiny little new browser do as little as possible? Yeah. Just text. Oh, even simpler than that. That would be kind of a boring web page too. Right? It's like links in the browser. Right? What, what's the tiny, tiniest interface? Yeah. No, I, I mean, I do want pictures on my web pages, guys. Sorry, like, I'm sorry. I'm not, I do not want to go back to the 1970s, right? I do want pictures. Pictures are good. How do I render pictures, text, other types of content? Yeah. Nope. Again, I'm not doing that. That's too hard, right? Pixels. Yes. Right? Pixel, position, color. You can, do, you can use that to do anything. OK, I can render text, I can render images, whatever. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean about the page? If the low level interface is pixels, I probably don't want to distribute my web page in pixels. Those would be big web pages um, and very difficult to manipulate. So where does the HTML and CSS rendering have to happen? somewhere else. And so the key idea here, which I'll just sort of uh, leave, leave with, and maybe we'll talk about this more money because this is kind of a fun project, um, is that the page is allowed to specify its own interpreter. So the page says, I'm an HTML and CSS page. And when you download me, you also download the interpreter that converts HTML, CSS to pixels. Why does that help? Why would that solve some of the problems that, we've, that we're trying to address here? I mean, at least we can agree that this thinner interface should be easier to secure. It's a lot smaller. But how does this prevent the problems that we've been talking about? Yeah, Rob. Right, so the web page is, by specifying its own rendering engine, the web page can be 100% confident that it will look identical on every browser. I don't have to w hope that IE is going to render the width properly as, as he talks about in the last example that we skipped, right? I have my own engine, and that engine spits out pixels, and I know it's correct. I've tested it. All I have to do is test it on one browser, and if every browser worked this way, every user would see an identical interface. Yeah, Steve. This is the, this is the, the from a user programming the browser to the developers who are going to have to create these engines on the web Well, here's the thing, though. Right? Do, who, do we need to create any new rendering engines? No, we've got them, right? All this would mean is that if IE worked this way, your browser could say, by the way, IE, I want you to render my page using WebKit. Thank you. And I want this version of WebKit, this exact version. Thank you. And then every Chrome, Safari, IE, if all of them worked this way, you'd see the identical page. Does that make sense? Yeah, so absolutely. There are libraries involved here. We have not 
shifted, we have not reduced any complexity from the process of page rendering and processing, but what we have done is change the interface that the browser has to support. Um, and that's, that can, that's pretty powerful, all right? Take a look at this, this is a cool project. You know, watch the rest of the video. There's some more fun examples. Watch some of James's other videos because again, they are, they are quite funny. Um, and good luck with the rest of assignment three. I'll see you guys on Monday.